This video made possible by the Bismuth Smith. Stick around till the end for a huge giveaway. This is Ooblack. You've probably seen it before, and it's a liquid of sorts that behaves really strangely. It pours like a liquid, but if you punch it, suddenly it seems to be solid, but only for a moment. And when the Hacksmith asked me if I could help them with their bulletproof John Wick-style three-piece suit, this was what I suggested. When James first asked me about it, he originally wanted to use the spider silk we grew in a previous video. But while that project has come a long way, and our bioreactor system is looking amazing, and our spinning machine is getting built, it's not quite ready to make a suit out of. So instead, I suggested I make some sheer thickening fluid for them to try out instead. The world of protective armor is always advancing, and one of the options that's being investigated to make armor stronger without adding much weight or bulk are fluids like Ublek, but made of more sophisticated ingredients than cornstarch and water. Fluids generally come in one of three forms, sheer thickening, Newtonian, and sheer thinning. Ublek is sheer thickening, so if we apply a sudden force, its viscosity will increase incredibly quickly to the point that it appears solid. But the effect is transient, and as soon as the force isn't applied, it reverts to a normal, liquidy state. A Newtonian fluid is things like water, honey, alcohol, and all the normal sorts of fluid you're used to, that thicken linearly with the amount of force applied. And finally, there are sheer thinning fluids. Things like ketchup, where they get thinner when you apply a force to them. This is why tapping the bottle of ketchup makes it come out. It literally makes the ketchup thinner and runnier for just a moment, helping it along. But how can we use this for a bulletproof suit? Well, if you could apply a really good shear thickening fluid to a fabric, it's a way to spread out the impact of an incoming projectile. Fundamentally, the reason a bullet works so well is because it's able to apply extreme amounts of force to a very small area on a target. This combination is ideal for penetration, as very small amounts of the target material is forced to deal with all of that energy, usually pushing the material to its breaking point and allowing the bullet to go through. But if you could spread that force out over a larger area, more of the material will be able to participate, lowering the forces on each individual fiber, allowing them to share the burden. Here's a simple example. We filled a bag with Ublek and placed it on a block of clay. We have an empty bag on a second block to compare as a control. When we take a small mallet to the control sample, it leaves a divot basically exactly the same shape as the mallet, and it goes pretty far down into the clay. But when we hit the Ublek, the impression it leaves is much, much wider. The Ublek very neatly spread the force out over a larger area, and the impression in the clay was much more shallow. In some studies, they were able to use fluids like this to stop bullets with half as many layers of Kevlar. Since each layer is doing more work to slow the bullet down, fewer are needed. Before we see how to make one for ballistic purposes, let's just start by making some ublek as the principle is the same. We start with a big pile of cornstarch in a bowl. Then, water is added bit by bit until all the powder is incorporated. When the concentration of starch is high enough, the properties of the mixture change dramatically, going from runny to almost crunchy. When everything is right, you can actually reach in and rip out handfuls of solids, only to find them liquefying in your hands. It's a pretty weird sensation. But why does this work? Why does putting cornstarch in water make it behave like this? The answer is nanoparticles. You see, the starch isn't dissolving into the water, it's just getting mixed in, more like sand than sugar. And starch granules are actually very tiny round particles, which makes Ublek a suspension of nanoparticles in a carrier fluid. So while the starch particles are technically free to move around in the water, they have to contend with all the other starch particles that are in there with them. When you apply a sudden force to the fluid, the water tries to move out of the way, but the particles are all suddenly forced into contact with each other. The harder you apply the force, the more particles end up getting stuck on each other. If every particle is pressing on every particle below it, then you get an exponential curve with more and more particles being pushed on. This makes the whole thing jam up as nothing has room to move, and it behaves like a solid. But once that force is removed, the particles can all decompress, allowing everything to flow like a liquid again, as long as the flow is slow enough to not cause more clumping. Now, while it would be awesome if we could just use cornstarch, the effect is better the stronger the base material is, and the finer it is, but only to a point. So while cornstarch granules can work, they're not very strong, and they're kinda too big. But longtime viewers may be able to think of one of our past projects that would be perfect for this, and that project is growing opals. Opal is a really amazing gemstone because it's got incredible play of color unlike pretty much anything else, and the secret to this color is again nanoparticles specifically silica nanoparticles, which need to all be exactly the same size and round, which also happens to be perfect for making sheer thickening fluid as well. In opal, the particles are carefully settled out, and they stack up into perfect crystal-like lattices which have the ability to bend light due to an effect called Bragg diffraction. If you want to learn more about opals, I highly recommend checking out the whole video we did on them. 
For today, the most important aspect is how we actually grow the nanoparticles, and it's actually fairly easy as chemical synthesis goes. And today, we're going to be making a massive batch. For the opal video, I was working in little 250ml flasks, but today we're going to be using 1 liter flasks. To get started, I set up a water bath in my fume hood. The whole system needs to be held at about 60 degrees Celsius, so a water bath is an easy way to do that, and I'm using a little thermocouple to measure the temp and make sure it doesn't drift. A stir bar is added to the flask, and a paper clip to the water bath to keep everything well mixed and even. To this we add 490 milliliters of 99% ethanol, 30 milliliters of water, and then the source of silica, which is a chemical called TEOS, which we need 60 milliliters of. When everything has been given a few minutes to mix and warm up, we add the catalyst which will kick off the reaction, 80 milliliters of 25% pure ammonium hydroxide. After only a few seconds, you can already start to see the formation of particles as the solution first turns opalescent and then eventually completely white and opaque. At this point, the particles have mostly formed, but we need to leave this for another two hours to make sure that all of the silica precursor gets used up and to let everything grow to its final size. When it's all done, we can take it off the heat and let it cool down. Already, this stuff is amazing, and literally anything it touches will be covered in shiny, iridescent layers as the particles dry into a film. Now we have to clean the particles. This is done with my gigantic centrifuge, which will collect all the particles at the bottom of these massive centrifuge bottles. Then the liquid can be poured off and replaced, but the particles are so densely packed at this stage that getting them back into solution is really tricky. The only way I was able to do it was with hours in an ultrasonic cleaning bath. I resuspended them in clean alcohol, and this took almost a day. We have to use a centrifuge because the particles are all on the order of about 300 nanometers wide, which is far too small to get caught up in a simple filter. Then, to get the fluid ready, I carefully boiled off a lot of the liquid before adding polyethylene glycol. We still want it to be thin enough to soak into the fabric, but not so thin that it'll take forever to dry into the cloth. The idea is that the alcohol will evaporate away, leaving only the PEG and particles behind. The PEG will stick to the fabric and keep the particles in suspension. We can't use water here because it's too runny and would just drip off the cloth. When all said and done, you end up with what looks like milk but is likely far less delicious and makes very poor quality cheese. When the samples were done, I packed them up and off they went to the hacksmith, and a few months later, this giant box arrived in the mail with the results. Before we look at what's inside, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, the Bismuth Smith, that is doing a huge giveaway. If you don't have the space for growing silica nanoparticles, but you want something colorful and beautiful, the Bismuth Smith is your one-stop shop. They make these amazing sculptures made of a metal eight times rarer than silver. They have a huge assortment to choose from, from statues of all sizes to these gorgeous giant rainbow crystals. Best of all, as I mentioned, they're doing a huge giveaway of $250,000 worth of product. If you want to be entered to win, then click the link in the description to enter the draw. These sculptures are absolutely stunning, so check them out after this video. Now, back to science. Here's the test sample. Off the bat, it's great to see that it survived the bullets and stopped them. While there is some spalling on the bottom layer, if we cut through it, we can see that there is not actually a penetration hole, and this is just an indent on the Kevlar. And these were shot with a 45 ACP round, so it had quite a bit of kick. But when we look at the control sample they sent along, made in exactly the same way but without the fluid, we don't actually see any difference. Exactly the same thing, spalling on the back, but no penetration. I guess it goes to show that their material stack up was pretty good at this point, and while I'm happy to call this a win, as it didn't make the material worse, it's not the satisfying huge improvement we were hoping for. But since it was our first ever batch, that's not that surprising, and the hacksmith had a suit to finish, so we couldn't do more follow-ups. It was a pretty Hail Mary idea, so while I was hopeful, I'm not really surprised. But it was cool to be included in their project. What they ended up making was pretty awesome, so if you want to see all the testing, be sure to check out the Hacksmith's amazing video and see the incredible final product, and how it held up to a submachine gun. I'm sure with many more batches we could refine the formula and make it better, and while we may do that, the chemistry, though easy, is quite tedious and stinky. So my desire to run that reaction more times and ruin more glassware with particles that fuse to the surface isn't strong at this particular red hot second, but we still want to come up with a cool armor improvement. So we've been cooking up a new monstrosity and are working on making lightweight tank armor in a kitchen microwave. We've been making steady progress and are starting to get some really solid samples, but it still needs some work before we take it to the range. If you're excited for that and our other upcoming projects, then be sure to subscribe as there's lots more where those came from. And as always, I need to say a special thanks to the patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that help make these videos possible. If you'd like to support the channel, there's some links below. But that's all for now, and we'll see you next time.